All right, welcome back to another installment of the Wide Ride Podcast. Manny Navarro here from The Athletic. Uh, busy day at the University of Miami. If you're a Hurricanes fan, uh, Mario Cristobal filling two of his vacancies, one of them being Shannon Dawson, the former offensive coordinator at Houston. He brings him in to coach quarterbacks and to run his offense. Miami fans are kind of ecstatic because uh, it felt like forever uh, since Josh Gaddis was uh, let go. And uh, really, it's only been a couple of weeks, but uh, Miami fans are anxious because they see spring football around the corner. And I thought, all right, who better to bring in than Sam Kahn, our resident tech expert from The Athletic, who knows Shan a little bit from his years with the Houston Cougars. Sam, you graduated from UH, right? I did, 2005, yeah. So how often did you go down there and watch them here in, in the four years that uh, – that uh, Shannon had been there, you know, coaching tight ends and coordinating quarterbacks. And I'm curious how many uh, in-person views you got. Yeah, pretty, pretty decent amount. Uh, you know, since Dana Holgerson got there in 2019, obviously that first year was, was of a lot of interest because it was a big deal for Houston to hire Dana Holgerson. And I had known Shannon's name. I hadn't really dealt with him a whole lot before, but he had been in that, that air raid tree, so to speak, working with, uh, with uh, Dana Holgerson at West Virginia for a little while. He had bounced around with some other guys in that tree uh, around college football, but a uh, pretty decent amount went down there. Like I said, it's only about a 25 minute drive from where I am, but got to see Shannon work with those quarterbacks a lot. Obviously he, his first year, I think he was tight ends coach, but they moved him to offensive coordinator and coaching quarterbacks the, the next year. Uh, and it was more of a, Hey, Dana wanted to get Shannon on staff. And that was a spot he had open that first time. And then, after a year, he he moved uh, Shannon to, to OC. It's just those two have a really tight relationship. There's a trust there in between those two. And and Shannon, I thought, obviously, the quarterback he worked with virtually his entire time there was Clayton Toon. And, and I think when you see the development that Toon had, uh, they did a pretty good job overall. I think Shannon did a really good job of developing his mechanics. And, and Clayton Toon in 2020 – if you would have told me that guy would have been the best passer in the American Athletic Conference, you know, three, four years later, I don't know that I would have believed that. But but you look at the work that Shannon did with him and and Clayton turned into one of the best quarterbacks in the country, quite honestly, it's, at least when you look at production. Yeah, I mean, I, I said this stat earlier on an audio version of the podcast uh, that I recorded with Bruce Feldman. If, you, if you're getting if you're watching us here on YouTube, me and Sam. Uh, the audio version of my interview with Bruce, who who helped break the story here for The Athletic in terms of Shannon coming uh, to Miami, uh, you know, I threw this stat out there. But in his three seasons as quarterbacks coach, which was 2020 to 2022, the Cougars threw for 87 touchdown passes, which was the 13th most uh, nationally, 65 percent completion percentage, which was 19th and uh, over 10,000 yards, which was 21st nationally. Um, I know he didn't coach De'Eric King while De'Eric was there because he was the tight ends coach. But I'm sure Derek probably has a lot of positive things to say about what he got out of his experience at Houston before he came to Miami. I mean, he, he played and he put up some huge numbers in, in, in a huge, you know, in the offense there. Even in 2019, I think for what was it four games that Derek played for for Houston that year uh, before uh, sort of sitting out the rest of the year to come to Miami. But I want to get Derek on to talk about him as well. But let's continue to pluck your brain here because you're in that city. Uh, there were some people on social media that were like happy that Shannon Dawson was leaving <laughs> Houston. I saw some of those comments. What's the reason? Why would they be mad at a guy who had an offense that averaged 36 points a game? I think it's just a general frustration where with where the program is right now. And you know how it goes, Manny. Anytime things don't go perfectly offensively, everyone wants to blame the offense coordinator and the play caller. That's that's just the whipping boy of college football fans across the country no matter what program you're at uh i mean I wouldn't say shannon was perfect by any means but this is i, I don't think the offense necessarily was their issue i think th there are a lot of more bigger issues on that team as to why they ended up where they ended up which was i think going eight and five this year as opposed to being a new year six team which is what people thought they could be a lot of people pegged them as potentially a 10 win maybe 11 or 12 win team that would be the group of five representative in the New Year Six Bowl. They fell well below that. Uh, some of it was offensive struggles, but I would say more of it was defensive. They they definitely struggled defensively late in games. They struggled to stop teams uh, at certain times, and uh, certainly there were issues offensively. But I, I don't attribute that necessarily all to Shannon Dawson. Some of that is personnel. Offensive line had to be a little bit better than it was. 
They were without their star running back, Alton McCaskill, all year long because he tore his ACL back in spring ball. And that was, I said that back in the offseason, that when that happened and that he was going to be out for the year, that Houston was really going to feel that loss because he's such a dynamic runner and he gives an extra element to their offense. And they had good backs, but nobody of his level or his caliber to really take pressure off Clayton Toon. It really was Clayton Toon and Tank Bell, the, the, the receiver, who was one of the most productive in the country. That's really where they had to hang their hat on offensively. And I thought they overall did a solid job. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to I look at his numbers right now. 4,000 yards passing, 8.2 yards per attempt, 40 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. Hard to hard to be at, mad at that. Yeah. I mean, Tank Dell was a guy that I know Miami was hoping would, would go into the transfer portal and come here last year when they were looking <laughs> to give Tyler Van Dyke uh, some weapons. Um, you, you saw the Hurricanes. I was out there with you in, in Houston before the Texas A&M game. We hung out a bit, had some wings, uh, had some beer uh, before all that, and, and went to go watch Miami play Texas A&M. Didn't look like a very explosive offense that night. Weren't an explosive offense all season long. Don't really have the big play receiver. They're still looking for that guy, but they do have Tyler Van Dyke back. I'm curious, how do you think Tyler Van Dyke and maybe Miami's personnel would fit this air raid based on the little you saw of Miami that night? <laughs> is 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 this going to be a rough transition for Shannon Dawson unless he gets a guy like Tank Dell at the receiver position? I, I don't think so. Certainly you want to find that dynamic guy to to, sp to slot into the Y and, and allow him to make plays. But Tank Dell had to play outside too the year before because they just didn't have – the caliber of outside receivers they needed. So, he, you know, you're talking about that 2021 season. He, he was kind of playing out of position. So, and he was still really productive in that spot. I think they'll figure it out. And that's part of the thing of, of this offensive philosophy is you, you lean on what you have from a personnel standpoint. So whatever your strengths are, that's what they're going to lean on. That's what Shannon Dawson will lean on. And the thing is, is with Tyler Van Dyke, and I know, Obviously, the opinions are run the gamut on him, but from a physical skill set standpoint, I I look at it, that that's a pretty good base to start with if you're Shannon Dawson, at least in in terms of just pure talent. So the question is is obviously it's going to take some time for them to get to know each other and develop some chemistry, but overall, in terms of Miami's offense from an athlete standpoint, I think they got they have certainly what they need because that the talent level overall, while they may not have a tank Dell the talent level overall, the baseline level is better than what Houston has. And so so that that's a good place to start if you're Shannon Dawson, if you're Miami Hurricanes. Clayton Toon, 6'3", 200 pounds, out of Carrollton, Texas. He was a three-star recruit, ranked number 827 overall. I don't know Houston's roster that well. You know it better than I do. Is there a quarterback that he recruited uh, that was one of his guys that was, I don't know, almost ready to replace Clayton. It, what was sort of the quarterback situation? How How is he as far as recruiting and bringing in, you know, quality guys? Yeah, no, they, they did recruit a guy in, I believe it was the 2021 class, which was right coming off that COVID year, Maddox Cop, And he ended up transferring, I think, before last season, ended up going to Colorado. Uh, I think he's transferred since. They really don't have they they do have a successor now, but they they went had had to go to the portal to get it. So that's something that they have not done super well the last few years is quarterback recruiting. Some of that can be attributed to just not being able to see guys because of that dead period. And and I, that it's funny you mentioned that that's a conversation I had with Shannon back I think it was summer of 2021, and you know Coppola had just been there for a few months, but we talked about how how many misses were going to be in that class nationwide because of how long uh, guys went without being able to be seen and, and having to sign without without being able to even take official visits. And so that became uh, that that was they didn't really have a clear successor in that regard. Uh, and then beyond that, Dana Horgerson's philosophy is very heavily leaning toward the portal. So it, it's not uh, if he Dana wants to get a guy that he can develop, but he also wants to get a guy that can play today. So Lucas Coley, who is, he's a guy who they got into transfer from Arkansas. 
Uh, they really liked him, Shannon, and, and Dana liked him coming out of high school. They weren't able to get him out of high school. He was a San Antonio kid. He ended up signing with Arkansas because he wanted to go to the SEC, but they were able to bring him in as a transfer, and, and they, they're really excited about him. They think he probably needs another year before he's ready to go, and that's why they went and got Donovan Smith from Texas Tech, uh, who started about eight games over Texas Tech. And, and I think you look at Donovan Smith as probably your starter next year, and then depending on you know if Donovan decides to stay another year or not, after him you figure Lucas Coley is that guy. So overall, it's been kind of a hodgepodge at quarterback. They haven't been able to really uh, find and develop a successor, a clear cut successor to Clayton Tune. And also, I think part of that is the fact that Clayton, I think you kind of knew he was going to stay around as long as he could because he right. was going to try and improve his draft stock. He was not uh, a guy that was going to declare for the draft early because he still had room to grow. So that I think that factored into it as well. But yeah, I, I would say that's one thing that as he goes to Miami, I would that was something I would keep an eye on. And, and it's going to be really important, obviously, because uh, you're going to have a little, you're going to be able to shoot uh, for a higher level prospect at Miami than you are at Houston. So I'll be curious to see uh, what Shannon does and and how well, if, he, if he's able to kind of improve his hit rate, so to speak, on that regard. But the strategy is probably going to be different from what it was uh, with Dana, where, like I said, Dana's, it, it's more, it's, I think Dana's less about developing guys three, four, five years. If he can do that, that's great, but it's more of a one to two year thing. And I got to have a guy ready to go when this next guy is out. Yeah. Yeah. Max Olson, uh, your, who does a podcast with you, did a, a great story a couple of weeks ago on the transfer rate of the quarterbacks. Anyway, I think it was said <laughs> 75% of the blue chip quarterbacks in the last four or five years have transferred. So, uh, you know, I know, I know recruiting quarterbacks is important, but it seems like, Going to the portal might be the best bet nowadays, as you said, finding a guy for one or two years, a guy who maybe comes in as a backup for one year and then becomes a starter the next. So you can have him learn the system. Um, how I'm curious, what did players say about the system? You know, the, the, the offense Houston ran. Was it really complicated? Because one thing I remember when Rhett Lashley was here for two years at Miami running a variation of the air raid, what he, what he called the power spread. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, like. Uh, the Miami guys always said, oh, it's so simple. The, the playbook's only, you know, it's really, really thin. What did guys say about the offense that that Holgerson and Dawson ran? That's pretty similar. It, it's not overly complicated. Dana comes from that same philosophy. Again, air raid style. And, and, and Dana, I think, would even push back on that pure air raid label because of how much they've expanded the run game and how much they run the ball. But it, it's all built on on less complication more reps it's more let's do these concepts and let's rep them a million times a bunch of different ways in different formations to create those mismatches and that that's the philosophy they use at houston uh it's something that dana's believed in now there are some things that get a little more complex here and there but that's more uh, i think that's more of a week-to-week -week thing where you're game planning and you're trying to figure out concepts and, and things you can do to win it was never a thing where I ever heard anybody at Houston say, well, the, yeah, this they're asking us to do a lot um, or, or they're asking us to do too much. Uh, I, always, I always felt, certainly with Clayton Toon, I always felt he had a really good grasp of the offense. And even when they had backups come in, they seemed to operate the offense pretty efficiently. Uh, so I think overall, it, it's it's let me put it this way. This is an offense that they've been able to have freshmen come in and play and contribute right away. Alton McCaskill, as a true freshman, came in and was a star. Matthew Golden last year, a receiver, four-star receiver they signed, was able to come in and start from day one. So when you're able to do that, to me, that's a sign of an offense that's easy enough to grasp that you're able to to be able to contribute right away, even with only you know five, six months of uh, repping in it and getting to know it. Did they play freshman offensive linemen? Miami's got two five stars and uh, <laughs> Samson Okunlola and Francis Maui Goa that everybody thinks, all right, you, you can put those guys in right away. I know Shannon's going to be more with the receivers and, and quarterback. It's Mario's territory, him and Alex Mirabal. But I'm just curious. I mean, how how easy was it maybe for offensive linemen to figure it out? Yeah, they 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 tried not to play as many freshmen. They they tried to get older. Dana's Dana's philosophy was get older. Yeah. Let's get as many old guys as we can. Uh, they did have some younger guys. They had a, a true freshman who who played some center this year. Didn't start, but he kind of rotated in. But overall, they've tried to keep that more of the experience in because they. I think the freshmen that they get are just not typically at the level that 
are the freshmen that you can plug in and play right away at college major college football. They they the, the freshmen they're getting on the line are developmental guys. So they're really not it's it's not so much a grasp thing of the offense. It's more of a are we physically ready to put him out there kind of thing. And they're, they're Houston typically doesn't get the level of lineman that you can plug out there right away on day one. How Sheridan with adjustments when when a team's got his number in the first half, do you see changes at all schematically? Does he is he good at that? I, I think it depends game to game. I think the biggest example you would see of that of him doing that well would be the Memphis game this year. They were they were shut down for I think three three plus quarters. They were down I think twenty six to seven in that game, and then rallied and ended up scoring. It was like twenty five unanswered points or something like that. Twenty six unanswered points to end up winning the game. The last second, uh, Miami fans should cue that up. That was a pretty that was a pretty <laughs> wild rally to watch. Uh, I think sometimes it it probably takes a little longer than you would like, but overall, I do think they do a good job. I thought I thought they get, did a good job. Shannon and Dana both did a good job offensively responding to that stuff. Uh, again, some of it too is based on personnel, but usually, it, even if it took longer than they wanted it to, you always felt eventually they were able to get it going. And I think some of that too is just personnel. Some of that is they had one of the best quarterbacks in the country and one of the best receivers in the country, and and you have got those two. You can figure some things out. I think they they did a really good job of scheming the scheming Tank Dell open a lot. Uh, so and getting Clayton Tune to attack with his feet. So overall, I think, like I said, more of a game to game thing. But overall, I I don't I didn't look at them as hey this is this is a this is a staff and a group of coaches that refuses to adjust. No, I I thought they were pretty adaptable and, and able to to change when needed to. Yeah. Um, in my interview with Bruce earlier today, just to tease that one more time for the wide right listeners watching us on 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 the YouTube page here. Uh, you know, we, we kind of went over his history working with Hal Mummy, uh, you know, Shannon's history um, at Southeast Louisiana. You know, he made a one year stop at Kentucky where maybe he didn't see eye to eye with the head coach there. Um, but it seems like with Holgerson, like that was really his dude. Right. I mean, he was with him at West Virginia. Um, what did Holgerson have to say about him just as, as a person? I mean, why were they such good buddies? Hey, it's just a trust. I think it's, it's because they, they kind of ran in those same circles and, uh, you know, you, you mentioned some of the schools that Shannon coached at guys from that tree, I think love the guys that are off the beaten path guys that come from smaller schools or lower division schools. I mean, Dana Holgerson came from Iowa Wesleyan and Valdosta state. So, the those are I think they have an admiration for guys who can do it well at that level and work their way up but overall it was just a matter of trust is is Dana brought in Shannon because he trusted him and he moved him you know to OC because he trusted him and he had a belief in him and overall I think that that is Shannon my, in my personal experience good guy easy to deal with low-key very a very uh just normal down to earth guy gets football uh really i love talking football with that guy he's he's pretty sharp uh and and's got a real grasp of you know the game the sport uh you know kind of what works what doesn't and like i said he's been around enough and had enough experiences that i think he he's a he's a good good seasoned veteran assistant coach that i think you can plug in in most places and have success you and I talked about this off air because I know every Miami fan listening to us is like, ask the question. Did he call the plays? <laughs> right. That's the that's the question with all these coordinators. Right. Because sometimes the head coach is the guy calling the play. You answered it off air for me. But can you repeat everything you said? Sure. Just, sure. Just yeah. Give it all back. Yeah. So that kind of went back and forth. I, I got the sense this year uh, that that Shannon did, did most of that this season uh, at Houston. Dana is a guy that likes to call it, but, and when he first took the Houston job, he was calling it initially, but Dana is also self-aware enough to understand that sometimes he has to take that off his plate because he's got other stuff to handle from a game management standpoint, from a program management standpoint. Uh, he's not, Dana's not so stubborn that, you know, as another coach uh, down this way that I cover is, that he's going to have his head in the play sheet or his head in the in the game plan all week uh, and damn everything else. Uh, Dana Dana is adaptable enough. And again, that's why I go back to the word trust is Dana trusts Shannon. And that's why he brought him in. And that's why 
there there wasn't going to be an ego thing that if Dana wanted to call it at some point, there was a stretch where Dana wanted to call it for whatever reason, because he has this feel or, or this intuition, because that's what Dana came up doing. Uh, you know, when he when he first got to Houston as a as an offense coordinator in 2008 under Kevin Sumlin, that's what that's how Dana kind of made his way. He did it at Oklahoma State. He did it at West Virginia. And it was about building trust with guys to hand it off. He did it with Jake Spavital at West Virginia when Dana realized, hey, I've got to handle more than just play calling. I got to give it up. So he let Jake do it. And then when Shannon was here at Houston, he let him do it uh, for some stretches as well. Like I said, I, I get the sense last year without having been in that room. And and talked extensively with that. I get the sense that last year Shannon did most of the most of the call in it uh, in 2022. But but it's definitely been a back and forth thing. Uh, it, it's Dana kind of goes in and out. I think depending on what that team needs that year and where he feels like his attention needs to be on it. So Shannon Shannon has called it like as he's done it here. He's done it other places. Obviously he did it at Kentucky as you mentioned, uh, Southern Miss. So he's got plenty of experience doing it for sure. Yeah. Sam, are you coming to South Florida for Miami, Texas a and The big, I mean, it's going to be another big preseason matchup, right? They're going to hype <laughs> That's it a up. good question. Yeah, that's a good question. We're sitting here in February. I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, I certainly would love to because I think, believe it or not, I don't think I've ever covered a game in Miami. So all those uh, years, I, I you never. Not I don't. Once? I don't think. I don't even. I don't. I'm trying to think if I've even been to Miami, and I may not have. So that that would be a good time to make it for the first time, because uh, it will be a big one. Because a And they have a really, really big pivotal season coming up. Speaking of faucets coordinators with Bobby Petrino over there, yeah. uh, they they have a lot of questions to answer this year after the disaster that was 2022's five and seven. Yeah. Uh, having having been there for that Miami Texas AM game, we both <laughs> thought, wow, is it not bad game, right? <laughs> little did we it know was five, ugly. <laughs> li, 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 little did we know it was going to end in five and seven for both of us. But uh, such, such was the when well, they were both ranked at the time too, weren't yes, they? Yes, yeah. I mean, they got all the preseason hype. Miami was sixteen, I think, in the preseason. What was A and M? A and M was six. Jeez, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh ugly result. Who has more pressure on them, Jimbo or, or Mario? What do you think? That's got to be Jimbo. Mario's in year two. Jimbo is in year five going into year six. That's uh, the obvious and, answer. <laughs> and the thing is, is both of them have contracts that really make it hard to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about pressure, I mean, how much pressure do you really have when a guy, when you owe a guy the rest of the contract or almost all of a contract? I mean, at this point, Jimbo's owed like $85 million right now Ooh. today if they fired him today. So how much pressure can you really put? But at the same time, if you don't bounce back at A&M this year, people were already upset last year. If you don't bounce back this season, I think people really start to lose faith. And it's not just a year-to-year -year thing. It's a long-term thing. It's like, man, did we get the right guy? Whereas if you asked any A&M fan a year ago at this time, they would unequivocally tell you that they got the right guy. And now – what last year did is create that question a little bit. And if you don't bounce back and at least get to eight and four, nine and three next year against a schedule, that's pretty, pretty easy. I should, I mean, as easy as an SEC schedule can be, but from a non-conference standpoint, it's a lot more manageable this year. If you can't get back to that, then I think that raised a lot of questions, especially after you just made the hire you did when you hired Bobby Petrino. You put Bobby Petrino, Steve Adazio, and Jimbo Fisher in the same offensive staff room. That is going to be interesting. Some fireworks for sure. Uh, how good is it? How good are they going to be? 23 guys entered the portal. Do you think some of the problems went out the door? Do you think they're going to be better? Cer certainly, th there was some of, obviously, some of those guys that left are guys that were suspended for half the season last year. Uh, yeah. Denver Harris is one of them who was suspended for seven of the 12 games that he played. And the five games he played, he was terrific. Right. But, and they they were able to keep the vast, vast majority of their starters. So I, I think I think Bill Connolly at ESPN posted that they lead the country in returning production. So that, so the question is, so from a, Ceiling standpoint, yes, they could potentially be really good. The question is what happens when they get banged up? Because when you lose 25 scholarship guys, that's depth. That's depth you're losing. And not some of those guys didn't play, but some of those guys were backups or guys that were rotational players that they really could use next year. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's going to be really where the question lies. And, and it's I think it's unrealistic to think that you're going to get through a season healthy in this day and age at every spot. So 
but they were able to keep the guys that they wanted to keep, so to speak, in terms of like starters, major stars, Evan Stewart, Connor Wegman, uh, Walter Nolan, guys like that. They were able to keep keep those major, major young stars, but they're going to have to come out of the gate quick, and they're going to have to they're going to have to show that this is a, a totally different team. Uh, but but I, they do they do have the potential to be really good. I'm just very much in the camp at this point, especially after you and I talked about AM last year before the Miami game. And I went on and on about how, how good I thought their offense was going to be and how good Haynes King was going to be and end up having right. an egg on my face at the end of it. I'm very much now in the camp that I'll believe it when I see it. I do think Connor Wegman's legit. Yeah. I think a superb talent. Evan Stewart is legit. They've got some really good young uh, defensive linemen, but it's going to come down to that offensive line of which they return every starter but that offensive line was really, really rough last year. Got banged up a lot. They've got to stay healthy up front, and they got to play a lot better. They were one of the worst offensive lines, performance-wise, in the country. Yeah, first test for Miami. Is that the first test for AM or who do they open with before? Uh, that's a great question. Let's look it up. Um, I should look it up, too. I should have had that on my screen instead of instead of uh, burying you under a, a question that was unprepared. No, it, it's okay. <laughs> we're in February. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, too, is I don't have the schedule – uh memorized because we've been dealing with the big 12 schedule for yes. so long uh that is the first test yeah because they, they get new mexico on september 2nd okay so at miami is the first you know power five team they play first major test they're gonna have and then they I get ulm and then they get auburn on september 23rd so we'll find out really quick uh about a&m and where they are yeah i'm guessing both teams will be better than five and seven but we'll see you would think, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, at this point, I think the range of outcomes for A&M is really wide. Yeah. So. Sam, you and I, I, I enjoyed the piece we did with Grace on Juco football, and I, I want to bring it up just so that the people who don't normally tap into The Athletic and maybe are watching us on YouTube get a chance to to listen to both of us talk about it briefly. Um, you know, junior college football, huge in Texas in terms of guys that end up going the Juco route, right? Guys out of the Texas area um, and, and schools, certainly in the Big 12 that recruit um, Juco players. Miami's had success with some Juco players. Their best receiver last year, Colby Young, came out of Lackawanna. Um, but you, Grace, and I uh, basically unearthed that, you know, the, the number of guys signing Power 5 after uh, two years in Juco has drastically trimmed down from 2018 uh, to, I think, right around 50, almost 68. 60 guys, 58, 60 guys, somewhere around there is the number now. Um, just your thoughts on that. And, and, and uh, you know, is this the end for Juco football? Like, is, is there no turning back because of the transfer portal? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's still going to be alive and well. And I'm really fascinated to see what these next few years bring about for it, because I think we, we talked a lot about the transfer portal in, in that. And I think that's a huge factor. And I don't, that's not going away. There's no secret. And I think it's no secret that Power 5 programs are going to look at Power 5 transfers over a JUCO prospect first in most cases for, for a lot of the reasons we dictated that story from uh, where that – what kind of eating, what kind of workout and training that that pro player has done, what the transcript situation is. Uh, and, and overall – and I had coaches tell me this, if you're a first-year head coach and you're reloading that roster – you can generate more buzz if you go get a transfer from power five school than you get from a Juco school. Yeah. And that sounds silly that the vanity of that sounds silly, but I think it's very much real when, when especially when you're a first year coach and, uh, and you're taking over a new program and you may be taking a program that's down uh, trying to generate that buzz. I think, I think you can't discount that part, but what I was really encouraged by with the story that we did was looking at how steady the numbers were at the group of five level. It yeah. actually has ticked up slightly, but it has mostly remained steady. And you see a lot of teams in the Mountain West, in uh, in the uh, Conference USA, uh, even the American, uh, even the Sun Belt. You you see a lot of schools in the group of five still utilizing it. Heck, U UTEP ended up signing twenty four JUCOs in this class. Uh, there were about five or six schools that signed ten or more. So there still is a landing spot for them. It's just that I think some of the higher level JUCOs that would have gone power five, five years ago are now going to end up going to group of five programs. Some of the top ones are still going to get recruited. And as we mentioned, you know, Alabama still recruits that, that uh, JUCO market. 
and there are other other power programs that are going to offer TCU signed the number one JUCO corner Channing Canada. He had like thirty eight offers, uh, you know, from across the country, including a ton of power five. So that there's still going to be some of those guys, but I think everybody else moves down just a few notches, and you probably are going to see, and I think I've seen it, some more guys go FCS coming out than you did in the past. So I don't think it's going anywhere. It's just like going to be a correction. But I'm also curious to see when we see the last of the COVID uh, eligibility guys move on, that 2020 class that has one extra year, I'm curious to see if the numbers tick back up a little bit because I do think that's a factor in all this too, that that there's still super seniors on some of these rosters. And so that's taken a few roster spots that – some of those would have gone to high school guys. Some of those would have gone to JUCO guys. So I, I'll be curious to see if that happens. But I think, I think it'll it'll sustain, but it won't sustain at the level that I think we saw it 10, 15 years ago. I think that's as long as the one time transfer rule and instant eligibility exists. I think that we're, we're never going to get back to the point to where it was in its heyday where somebody got a job and he went and hammered the JUCO to go get his first class. Last question, because you are in Big Twelve country and we do have an in state team, UCF joining the Big Twelve. Uh, of the four new programs, BYU, Cincinnati, Houston, and UCF, who wins the Big 12 first? Wow, that's a great question. I would have to – well, if Luke Fickle was still at Cincinnati, he would have said Cincinnati. I'm going to say BYU because I think they have a much sta- more stable coaching situation than everyone else. Kalani Sataki is the longest tenured guy of of all the coaches at those four schools. Uh, that they, they do, I think physically they're going to be ready. Uh, obviously those guys, a lot of those guys are older because they do, you know, the two year mission before they, they start playing. So you're getting older guys. I think that'll be able to adapt quicker uh, to big 12 play. And they already have been playing you know, power five opponents on a regular basis anyway, as they've scheduled out. So uh, I, I think if I, if I look at a team and I'm going to start with line of scrimmage where I think that's where they're going to be good. Uh, and it won't be right away. I think it'll take a little time. But they're the team that I look at first that I think has the best shot right out of the gate. But that's not to discount any of the other ones because Cincinnati's been to the playoff. UCF, we know obviously what they've done in their past. And Houston has, has shown some really high highs as well. And I think of all of them, Houston, to me, in my opinion, has the highest ceiling because of where it's located. It's located in Houston, one of the most fertile recruiting hotbeds in the country. Mm-hmm. And so being able to do that, uh, and and recruit against TCU and Texas Tech and some of these other Big 12 schools. Now, they used to lose guys because of guys wanting to go to Power 5 programs. Well, now they're going to be one of them. So I think that's going to give them a higher ceiling in the long term. But I think UCF is right there on that similar track with Houston in that they're in a, a, they're in a state that's a hotbed for talent. You can really recruit guys. And with that Power 5 label now, it's going to really give you a chance – to to land some guys that maybe you hadn't before out of high school or get some of these transfers that maybe you wouldn't have gotten before as well. So uh, I think UCF and Houston are both similar, going to have really, really high ceilings in this conference because it is going to be wide open. This is not a conference with two big dogs anymore, or a, they don't have a Clemson, so to speak, like the ACC does. Really, it's going to be up for grabs right now. You had TCU coming off the playoff, but that was a coming off a five and seven season. It's going to be, I think, TCU, Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, who just won the Big 12 championship. Those are the teams, I think, in the very early going are going to be the ones fighting for supremacy. But those other schools that come in as they come in and get used to playing a Power 5 schedule on a full-time basis, when you when you factor in UCF and Houston's recruiting base, I think that's going to give them some really, really high potential down the road. Sam, you're a beast. I love having you on. You mentioned BYU first. Miami plays BYU in 2026 and 2028. They do have a a series, so uh, they'll they'll be playing a Big 12 team then. Interested to see where where everybody is in the landscape of college football with the 12-team playoff and everything else. So, anyway, thanks for coming on, talking uh, Shannon Dawson and everything else. We covered a ton of subjects. Make sure you follow Sam. Uh, on social media make sure you read all this great work in the athletic i really think we have one of the best teams uh covering college football and all the sports and uh, sam is a big piece of that so make sure you follow him thanks so much man appreciate you having me